This is Dennis McMahon, and welcome to Positively Vermont. And today my special guest is Oliver Pearson, the Lakes and Ponds Program Manager for the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation. Welcome, Oliver. Thank you, Dennis. Great to be here. I want to be speaking today about uh, something that's on the uh, agency's mind and everyone else's mind, and that's all the lakes and ponds uh, of the, in, in the state of Vermont and how uh, your agency is dealing with various uh, issues that come up in, in, the, in the environment and also most particularly how people can participate in, in your uh, program's activities. But first, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, Dennis. Well, again, my name is Oliver Pearson. I manage the lakes and ponds programs for Vermont uh, Department of Environmental Conservation or DEC. I live in South Burlington uh, with my family, and I have a natural resource management background, specializing, specializing in, in freshwater management. So I have the, the great privilege of uh, leading a team of experts and professionals here at Vermont DEC to manage, regulate use of, monitor, and uh, work with you know, lakeshore property owners, towns, and Vermonters who use lakes to, to recreate, uh, to really try to understand what we have here, or what's, what's great about our lakes and ponds, what some of the water quality challenges are, and how the state and our partners and, and regular Vermonters can work with us to try and improve water quality and maintain these, these great lakes that we all love and enjoy here in Vermont. Great. Can you give us uh, an, uh, a summary of the extent of uh, the lakes and pond resources throughout the state, going north to south, sure. east to east, any way you want to do it, feel it? Yeah, we have over 800 lakes and ponds uh, in the state, and about 250 of those are, are over 10 acres in size. And you know, we, were, we have some extremely large lakes. Obviously, Champlain is, is a lake we share with New York and Quebec. Men from Magog is, is also a lake we share with Quebec. And then Bomazine is the largest lake that's entirely in Vermont. We have some large reservoirs in the southern part of the state uh, that are great for, for recreation and, and fishing. And then you know, some, more, some more natural lakes, some, some created by glacial activity um, in the northern and uh, northeast, in particular parts of the state. But really, we have we have you know, lakes and ponds scattered throughout the state, and hopefully, most Vermonters, when when you say you know what's the what's your favorite lake, they can think of something that's that's pretty close to their to their home, and they don't have to drive too far to, to get to a lake to enjoy for swimming, boating, uh, fishing, or just uh, to enjoy the the aquatic habitat and the wildlife that that uh, live and, and benefit from from those lakes and ponds. So, we're lucky also that that most of our lakes and ponds have a pretty good water quality. For all, um, but there is a challenge we, we see when we do our monitoring that many of our lakes have have trends that are sort of headed in the wrong direction. While the, the water quality is still good, you know, we're seeing some increases in, in um, some of the, the parameters that, that suggest that some water quality challenges might be coming. Things like phosphorus, the, the total phosphorus concentration in many of our lakes and ponds is, is increasing. Things like water clarity, you know, if the water clarity is, is decreasing, that isn't great. And then some other measurements of, of biological productivity in the lakes, like, like chlorophyll A, are also increasing. So those are some of the trends that we're concerned about and we're trying to either stabilize or reverse, and again, maintain these, these great lakes so that we can enjoy them for recreation and aquatic habitat, you know, year round. We're recording this on March 28th, and uh, I guess one of the issues right now is the ice out situation. Can you explain what ice out is and, and what precisely can people do about it or observe it uh, or what sure, the agencies sure. do? Yeah, so our lakes, you know, are, are very accustomed to the four seasons we have in Vermont, and as, as the lakes freeze in the winter, that, that you know creates some changes. Um, to the, the obviously the biological activity in the lakes and, and the chemistry of the lakes as well. So in, in the winter, you know the the, the surface of, of the lake freezes and, and the lake ice can, can get quite deep. Um, and then right below um, the ice, the water is a bit warmer because the heaviest, coldest water sinks down uh, to the bottom of the lake. Um, and many of the, uh, the the lake wildlife, you know, fish, for example. 
just sort of go dormant uh, over the winter months. Um, and so, yeah, as you, as you said, come, come March, April, we begin to see warmer temperatures. The ice begins to melt, starting at the edges. And essentially, when, when the ice clears, when the, when the lake is, is free of ice or ice out, you know, at that point, the lake mixes. Uh, the, the heaviest water at that point is the water from the ice that has just melted and heaviest, coldest. So that drops to the bottom of the lake and it forces slightly warmer water up and the lakes mix in that point of, of the year, you know, before any really plant growth has begun, is a great time to really understand what the chemical composition of the lake is and how much nutrients are available uh, for, for plant growth. So it's, I think folks are familiar with some of the ice out competitions in the state, like Joe's Pond that have been going on for years. That's a lot of fun. But if you look at the data uh, of when ice out actually occurs, we, we're, we're running this on around 20 lakes where we have a good record of data. We're seeing that ice out is now occurring earlier uh, than it used to. And it's, you know, it's about every, every decade on average, ice out occurs almost two days sooner than it did previously. So that doesn't sound like a lot, you know, what's, what's two days over 10 years, but if that, if that continues, you know, and in, in, you know, 50 years, we're going to, instead of seeing ice out, uh, you know, around March 25th, it would be around March 15th. And so you can, you can see how that, that trend would become more worrisome over time. So that's, that's just a, a quick indication of um, what's happening with ice out dates. And so we ask Vermonters to, to track ice out on their you know, local ponds or lakes and let us know. Uh, we have a website, on, we, have a, uh, we have a page on the EC website where folks can enter ice out data for, for lakes that are adjacent to, to them. And we're tracking that information. And really because we like to go out as soon as the lakes um, are free of ice, and when they've mixed to do some monitoring in the spring, as we, that's our spring phosphorus monitoring program. When we go out on, on one or two lakes per day, you know, in some pretty cold temperatures at times and collect a bunch of information to give us a sense of, as I said, what, what the nutrients are available for plant growth uh, before aquatic plants grow, before algae starts to grow. And we have those trends over time. We have spring phosphorus data going back almost 40 years. And so we can really understand what the impacts of things like increasing nutrients flowing into a lake or climate change are from this long-term data set. And that helps us plan lake protection, lake management, and lake restoration as a result. Well, in general, what, what effect does climate change have on, on the lakes and ponds in our state? Yeah, what we're seeing in Vermont is uh, increased temperatures in the summer, shorter winters, and then the precipitation um, is a bit flashier now. So we'll have fewer days of rain, but, but more rain uh, in, in concentrated larger storms. Um, so you may not get the, the steady drizzle um, that's, that's great for, for agriculture and, and for bringing in you know, slow and steady flows of water into our lakes, but you get these large storm events. You know, folks can think back to uh, October, 2019, at that big Halloween storm, and that's that's an example, or even going back further, Irene. So we're seeing these large storm events that dump a lot of water onto the land and into our streams and eventually into the lakes. Um, and then some periods of, of dryness. I think the last two summers have had some, some sustained droughts, particularly in the northern half of the state. We did have a little bit of flooding in the southern half last year, but the northern half has had droughts over the last two summers. So all that combines to create some challenging conditions for our lakes. It's the water is increasing in temperature, the growing season is expanding. And so we're seeing more aquatic plant growth and more algae growth. And, and the algae manifests itself. You know, uh, I think folks are familiar with the, the blooms or the cyanobacteria or, or blue-green algae blooms we see on some lakes, parts of Lake Champlain, for example, Lake Carmi. And you know, that's really not consistent with what we expect from the water quality in our lakes. And so that's a problem we're trying to address Lakes that have you know, aquatic plants will see increased plant growth as a result of, of climate change. And some of these plants can actually re reach nuisance stage and, and impede our ability to recreate and you know, degrade some of the wildlife habitats. So aquatic nuisance plants um, growth can be you know, heightened through, through climate change. And that's, that's a challenge as well. And then finally, these large storm events 
can you know lead to a lot of water flowing across agricultural fields, across impervious surface in our towns and on our properties, and all that can combine to you know, create erosion and dump additional nutrients into the lakes. And so the 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 climate change increased precipitation signal has has led to what we call increases in loading of, of nutrients. And in turn, that can, can create an environment in the lakes where there's, there's more nutrients to fuel plant and algae growth. Uh, and, and those can lead to some of the challenges that I mentioned, as well as um, decreased water clarity. So we still have plenty of lakes that are, are very clear um, and are, are fantastic for recreation in the summer. But the list of lakes with, with increasing total phosphorus trends as a result of, of climate change and additional nutrients coming in is is growing and it's it's particularly our, our low nutrient, very clear lakes um, that are seeing these increasing total phosphorus trends. We, we refer to those lakes as oligotrophic or low nutrient and almost all of the oligotrophic lakes in the state have increasing total phosphorus trends. And over time, we'll move away from that very clear water with very limited plant growth that I think you know many Vermonters have, have come to enjoy and expect. So that's a challenge not just because of climate change, but perhaps exacerbated by climate change that we're working uh, pretty <clears throat> diligently to address. What about the human contribution here? Uh, recreation, construction, uh, pavement, and, and things like that. Could you discuss sure. that impact? Yeah, so I mean, we think about pollution as a point sources and, and non-point sources. So, you know, a point source might be a, a wastewater treatment plant <clears throat> that has effluent um, flowing into a river and eventually into a lake. Whereas a, a non-point source, you know, typically you think of a, of a farmer applying manure or fertilizer to his or her field, a uh, precipitation event happens and some of that manure or fertilizer gets caught up in, in the surface water that's flowing across the land, into ditches, into streams, and eventually into lakes. So, you know, we have these, these two sources of, of pollution in broad categories, point and, and non-point. You know, and so human activities obviously contribute to, to both of those types of pollution. You know, with, with increased uh, development, particularly around lakes, you see increases in impervious surface that can really allow water to, to move very quickly uh, across the, the surface of, of, of the land after, after rainfall. Uh, that's that speed when it does hit dirt um, can contribute to erosion. And that's a source of both sediment and, and nutrients into our lakes. So, so we're concerned about that. We're doing a lot of work to mitigate and reduce stormwater runoff. Um, and as, as we said earlier, that's, that's exacerbated by climate change. And then, you know, when you look at Lake Champlain and other, and other large lakes, typically the largest source of, of pollution are these non-point sources. You know, Vermont has, has a lot of land and that's sort of rural in character. Uh, we, have, we have, you know, the agricultural industry is important here. Some parts of the state logging is, is important. And those types of activities you know, need to be managed in a way that, uh, is, is that's li that limits uh, surface water runoff and nutrient runoff. And that, that can be done through the implementation of, of best management practices um, where, where landowners, farmers, et cetera, um, are, are conscientious of the impacts of their activities on the land and on waters and can do certain things like, like cover cropping, like better management of, of manure pits um, to, to reduce surface water runoff and, and reduce nutrient pollution. So, you know, I think the, some of the increases we've seen in, in nutrient concentrations in our lake is, is a result of, of human activity. That's, that's clear. Um, in terms of point sources, we are trying to modernize our, our wastewater treatment plants and so that there's fewer of these combined sewer overflows that, that can take place after large storm events. And in terms of non-point solution, non-point source pollution reduction, there's a lot of great work happening with, with the, that the state is leading with our partners to reduce those those sources of pollution. But it's it's going to be a it's a it's a long-term effort, you know. And and we make progress in one area, and then other challenges crop up somewhere else. We're fortunate to not have that many lakes in the state that are listed as impaired. We only have one lake in the state that's listed as as in crisis. So that's, that's, you know, th those are steps in the right direction and we're trying to continue to reduce really the, the, the principal source of, of pollution to our lake, which is this non-point source pollutions from our land use. And um, hopefully we'll, we'll continue to make progress what, what is the one progress that, in doing that. What is the one that you said is impaired, not doing so well? 
What lake is that? Uh, so we have a couple of lakes um, are, are listed as impaired. You know, our two largest lakes, uh, Champlain and, and Memphis Magog, are both formally listed as impaired, um, predominantly for, for phosphorus. Uh, they have in lake phosphorus concentrations that are above a level that allows for what we call full support of, of uses, where all recreational uses and aquatic habitat uses can really occur without any disturbance. So Champlain and, and Memphis Magog uh, are impaired. The state has worked with the Environmental Protection Agency to develop uh, phosphorus reduction plans. These are these documents you may have heard of called total maximum daily loads. We're working towards re reducing the amount of phosphorus loading into the lakes uh, over a certain time period. Um, and, and we re report on that to the public and to the Environmental Protection Agency and spend a lot of time and effort working both in the lake and more importantly in its watershed to really try to implement activities on the land that can improve water quality in the lake. So those are two examples of lakes that are impaired. Uh, Vermont does have one lake that's, that's designated under, under state statute as in crisis, and that's Lake Carmi. You know, Lake Carmi was suffering from increases in phosphorus to the point where there was very frequent um, blue-green algae blooms in, in the summer and fall months that were you know, impeding recreation, creating some human health risk, because at times, very rarely, but at times, these blue-green algae blooms can become toxic and was having a negative impact on, on property values uh, up there in Franklin. So the, the state legislature listed that lake as in crisis a number of years ago, and we've been working to implement a crisis response plan and try to improve water quality in, in Carmine uh, since then. So, you know, that's, that's one end of the spectrum. Then you can think about the other end of the spectrum, think about, you know, Lake Willoughby and, and Lake Caspian or Lake Rapunda down Southern Vermont. These are, these are beautiful lakes with, with good water quality and, and where our, our management objectives are really succeeding. We're able to enjoy, um, you know, full support of, of all designated uses on those lakes. That's not to say they don't have water quality challenges that, that we're also working on. Um, but I, I, I want to make sure people understand that the, the, those lakes that are impaired, like Lake Champlain and Memphis Magog, are, are one end of the spectrum, and the vast majority of, of the lake of the state's lakes and ponds are, are not impaired, and we're able to really do what we want, you know, swim, boat, fish, et cetera, on those lakes without natural uh, problems getting in our way. And in addition to uh, monitoring, which I believe you discussed. Uh... Uh, and the regulation, the presence and enforcement of regulations. Uh, what other efforts is uh, the department doing to uh, preserve, uh, protect rather, protect the uh, sure. lakes and ponds? Yeah, it all starts with monitoring. You know, if we don't know what the, uh, the conditions of the lake are, then you really won't know what should be done to, to either maintain good water quality or, or restore water quality to where we'd like it to be. So the monitoring and the assessment is, is a critical first step. You know, when it comes to dealing with aquatic nuisance species or aquatic invasive species, we do a lot of work to both um, prevent the spread of those uh, aquatic invasive species from one water body to another. You might see at the fish and wildlife access areas, you might see people working as breeders or lake stewards that talk to you about how to remove any aquatic vegetation from your boat uh, with, through what's called a clean, drain, and dry approach so that you avoid inadvertently taking a piece of you know, invasive milfoil plant from one lake where it exists to another lake where it doesn't exist. So that's a really important piece, piece of our work, you know, preventing the spread of, of aquatic invasive species. We also do a lot of work with uh, shoreland property owners, be it towns, be it other state agencies like a state park, be it private landowners, so that they understand uh, really how they can manage those properties in that first zero to 250 feet from the lake's edge in a way that's that's lake friendly. And so we have a, a lake wise program, which has really voluntary efforts that property owners of all types can, can implement so that their properties don't lead to lots of surface water runoff, lots of erosion, um, and restore some of the habitat that was there uh, historically before human settlement. So the lake wise program is, is a great example of how we, we work with those folks who are fortunate enough to own these, these shoreland properties around lakes. Um, you, you mentioned regulation. You know, ensuring that, that Vermonters understand if they want to develop around a shoreland, what's required, if they want to encroach into a lake, you know, with a raft or a dock or, or a pipe, you know, what's required and what isn't required. Some of those activities are exempt from permits, others require permits. 
And then, as I said, uh, all of the aquatic nuisance control activities, some of those require permits and we regulate those activities as well. So those are, those are the main categories. And I know it's a nice mix of monitoring and understanding what's happening in the lake, doing some regulation to ensure that the state laws are held up and doing a lot of outreach with the public so folks can understand what the conditions of their lakes are and how to manage property in a way that's lake friendly. And if they want to get involved um, with, with improving water quality in the lakes, what steps they can take. Well, uh, speaking of getting involved, uh, I, I know there are a number of, uh, of projects you mentioned uh, in uh, on the website and uh, in other materials. Tell us about sure. the lay monitoring. Program. Yeah, we're lucky to have this really rich data set. Also, going back forty years, where where trained volunteers agree to uh, go out on a lake or a pond at least eight times per summer and collect. Um, three really three types of data. They, they collect water samples, which we analyze for total phosphorus. And we also, a second water sample that we filter and then analyze for chlorophyll A, which is a measure of biological productivity and growth uh, on the lake. And they also measure the water clarity using a sort of a colored disc that they lower down into the, the water and see how many meters it is before they can't see the disc anymore. And those three pieces of data, phosphorus, chlorophyll, and clarity, can really tell us a lot about the, the lake's health. So we rely on these volunteers to do that. They're trained and given equipment, and we, we pick up the samples from them periodically over the course of the summer to be analyzed in a state lab. But it's, it's really the work of the volunteers that has given us a, an idea of how our lakes are doing, what are the trends that we're seeing statewide, how do our statewide trends compare to what's happening throughout this region. And that data has been really influential. Some of that data let us know that in lakes where there's a lot of shoreland development, we're seeing some, some increasing phosphorus trends, some, some worrisome water quality trends, and, and that helped uh, really create the, the justification to pass the Shoreland Protection Act, um, you know, maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, and, and today we use that data to make decisions about, does this lake need to be restored? Or is this lake of such great water quality that we should try to increase protections for it to, to maintain it as is? It's much easier to maintain a lake at excellent water quality uh, and, much, and much more cost effective as well than to try to restore it once its water quality has, has become degraded or impaired. So the volunteer lake monitoring program operates yeah, at about 75 lakes in about 10 sites on Lake Champlain. And if folks are interested in, in, in monitoring uh, a lake in this way, you know, just reach out to us. There's contact information on the Vermont DEC lay monitoring program webpage. And we're always happy to consider bringing on <clears throat> new volunteers at, at new water bodies. Um, so that's that's a great way to, to get involved. But if, if going out eight times or more in, in a summer may be too difficult, you know, there's other there's other ways to get involved that, that aren't as <clears throat> demanding. We, we train uh, volunteers to make observations about there, whether or not they see cyanobacteria or blue green algae Explain on the lake. Explain what that is, cyanobacteria. We've used it quite a bit today. Sure, Tell us sure. what that is. So that's that's a form of algae. Um, it's often referred to as blue green algae. We also use the term phytoplankton, but it's it's you know a, a single cell organism that um, grows in our waters uh, and and can really benefit and take advantage of conditions that are are conducive to its growth. And so. Think about some of the, the large shallow bays on Lake Champlain, um, Missisquoi Bay, St. Albans Bay. You know, these bays get warmer in the summer. There's a lot of nutrients flowing into these bays um, through the tributaries, um, the Missisquoi River, for example, you know, the Rock River uh, because of land use in those areas. And so the blue-green algae uh, is able to take advantage of the, the warmth, the sunlight, and the nutrients to grow very quickly. And that creates these blooms. Um, and they're often green in color. They can have a, a pretty nasty odor. And the, you, you see those and you don't want to go in the water. You, you want to stay away. And that's, that's the advice we give people as well, because as I said earlier, very rarely they can become toxic. And we did have a number of, of dog fatalities uh, a number of years back in Vermont because of toxic blue-green algae blooms. So, you know, I, I would say for the water quality challenges that we're dealing with in, in Vermont, these, these blue-green algae or cyanobacteria blooms are one of the largest challenges in our lakes that we're trying to, to address and, and really prevent from getting any worse and try to limit the spread and extent of these blooms um, in the summer months. And that's, that's an uphill battle, 
but it's something that we are very focused on. And so getting back to how folks can get involved, we're always looking for volunteers, both on Lake Champlain and also our inland lakes to, to make you know, weekly observations, but just you know, walking by the lake uh, is, is, is suitable on absence or presence of, of these blue-green algae or cyanobacteria blooms because that data helps us look at trends and see where the hotspots are uh, for these types of blooms during the summer and, and fall months. So, so that's important. You know, then the last thing, we, we would, uh, another way folks can get involved is uh, we have a program called Vermont Invasive Patrollers, where we also want folks to help us identify any, any invasive species. So that also requires some training. And you know, if you're interested in, in plants or you're curious about some of these invasive animals like zebra mussels, this might be a good one for you. Um, and our Vermont invasive patrollers are our eyes and ears on the ground and have helped us identify uh, outbreaks of, of invasive species in a water body where they haven't been historically. And then we can respond very quickly to try to eradicate the threat at that point. So that's a, that's a good one. But I, I think it's also important that the folks know that the, the, the ice out form is, is an example of how you can communicate with us. If you see ice, ice changing on your lake, let us know. You know, and we're always, we always want to hear from people about what's happening on their lakes and ponds. So the Vermont DC Lakes and Ponds staff, all our contact information is on the webpage based on our area of expertise. And we rely on input from Vermonters to just hear what's happening. And then, you know, if you think you've seen something happening on your lake that may not be in compliance with, with state statute, the DEC has an environmental enforcement page where you can make an anonymous uh, report about you know, something on that's happening on a lake that, that may seem odd, like someone's dumping sand into a lake. I haven't seen that before. Maybe, it's, maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe it's permitted, but maybe not. And so you can make a, an anonymous report on this uh, env environmental enforcement page, and then we'll look into it and see what's going on. I know every, every few years, there's a lot of attention on invasive species, uh, particularly with plants. And I, I think we had the snail Daughter or snail borer or something a few years. Tell us where did the what are the big ones that that you're, you're concerned about and, and where do they come from? Sure. Well, our, our waterways are, are connected you know, in, in many ways. You know, you can think of physically connected where, where Lake Champlain, you know, excuse me, uh, drains no drains, uh, it doesn't drain it. If, if you follow Lake Champlain south, there's, there's a canal, the Champlain Canal. And that eventually connects to other waters uh, in the state of New York. Uh, but when folks move boats around from one water body to another, you know, that can bring animal and plant material and, and spread uh, both native, but also invasive species, species that haven't been here historically and can alter the ecosystem in, in ways that may not be desirable and may threaten native plants and animals um, you know, once they get established here. So, you know, historically in Vermont, you know, I think it's been 40 years, but the, 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 a plant called Eurasian water milfoil uh, was introduced. Uh, that's a very fast growing and, and aggressive plant. Um, and, and it can, you know, particularly in nutrient rich waters, it can become very persistent and prevalent in our waters and, and uh, in, interfere with recreation. Um, so that's an example of a, of a plant that's an invasive species in Vermont that I think a lot of folks are, are familiar with. And we, we, we have aquatic nuisance control management activities every year to limit the spread of milfoil and water bodies where it's already established. Now, on the, on the animal side, folks may have heard about zebra mussels. You know, these are, these are small non-native mussels that are established in a number of, of water bodies in the state. Not too many yet, but they're, they're in Champlain, for example. And, you know, these can cause problems where they can alter the ecosystem, as I said, in ways that may make things difficult for native species. They like to set up shop on, on pipes. And so not so much in Vermont, but other parts of the US, they've uh, damaged water intake pipes and that's been costly to fix. So we're, we're tracking the, the spread of zebra mussels around the state, hoping to limit that. There's a small fish called the round goby, which is not yet in Vermont, but that's been in, in the news a bit recently as it's getting closer to Vermont. It's, it's in parts of New York already. And that would have some negative impacts on, on, on other fisheries, on existing native fish species if it does get into Vermont. So we're watching the spread of round goby and trying to put in place some, some measures to limit it. So, you know, through connected waterways and through boats and other things that move from one body of water to another, we, we see the spread of, of invasive species. And we spend a lot of time thinking about how to limit that spread and, and you know, try to keep, try to preserve sort of the natural character of our, of our lakes and ponds uh, to the extent possible. Great. 
Uh, are there any legislative initiatives or programs uh, pending in Vermont or in the federal government or maybe even uh, uh, elsewhere uh, that uh, people should be aware of and maybe they can uh, uh, lend a hand with? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. It's been, it's been exciting to watch Act 76 and, and the clean water service providers get, get stood up in the Lake Champlain and Lake Nymphomagog watersheds and that, that act provides funding for activities to really address some of our, our clean water challenges. And so specifically for lakes, there is funding for shoreland restoration projects uh, through Act 76. And so folks that you know, are interested in shoreland restoration on, on inland lakes in the Champlain and Memphremagog watersheds, as well as on those two large lakes themselves, those are um, you know, important uh, initiatives to, to stay, stay abreast of. A couple other things, um, I think there's, there's been an increase in our lakes and ponds in the use of, of motorized vessels that, that produce large wakes uh, for wake sports. These can be referred to as wake boats. And uh, there, there was a, a piece of legislation and it was introduced in the House this session that would have requested the, would have required rather the state to, to put in place some regulation for wake boats under the use of public waters rule. That draft, that, that legislation that was introduced didn't make crossover. And so it was probably you know, stuck on the wall as they say, but the state did receive a petition from a group of um, concerned Vermonters re requesting that we do the same thing, that we come up with some regulation uh, for the use of these, these motorized vessels that produce wake. So we're just getting going on reviewing that petition and there'll be public participation opportunities in the future. And eventually we'll, we'll consider uh, some regulation for these, these wake producing vessels under the use of public waters rule. You know, there's a precedent there where the state under that same rule prohibited the use of personal watercraft, also known as jet skis, on lakes uh, smaller than 300 acres. So we'll take a look at this petition and and see if, if, if there's compelling reason to regulate uh, these, these motorized vessels that produce large wakes so that we stay consistent with our water quality standards. You know, and then finally, we are seeing some very high quality or excellent quality waters with these increasing total phosphorus trends that I mentioned. And, and so for those lakes, we're interested in increasing protection. And we've received uh, petitions from lake associations and towns and in four communities requesting that the state uh, really put those lakes into a higher classification, an excellent class that has some additional protections associated with that. So that's Lake Caspian in Greensboro, Maidstone Lake um, up in Maidstone, Echo Lake in Charleston, and Shadow Lake in Glover. Those four lake communities and, and, their, and their towns in some cases have asked the state to formally reclassify those lakes in a way that recognizes their excellent water quality. And as I said, puts in place some resources to, to protect those waters and add some additional statutory protections as well. So we're reviewing those petitions and it's great to see these concerned Vermonters taking such you know, tangible steps to try to uh, improve, or I would say try to protect their, their excellent quality waters that they, that they love and live close to. So those are some of the things that, that come to mind. Um, and we're, we're always excited to see you know, what, what, the, what the legislature, what, what other ideas the legislature comes up with. I, I think that we talked a little bit about aquatic invasive species work and uh, the funding at the state level has been pretty stable for that work while the number of, of water bodies that are infected uh, with invasive species has increased and uh, the number of, of um, species is, is increasing as well. So I, it would be great to see the legislature look at that issue and consider whether some additional funding is needed to help the state uh, limit the spread of invasive species. Right. Uh, finally, let me ask this, uh, in terms of community outreach uh, and schools and civic groups and uh, sporting groups, uh, tell us uh, what uh, your agency has available uh, for people to get more information, speakers or, or websites or, or uh, films and things. Just give us an idea about that. Yeah, we, we, we love the opportunity to speak with um, schools, associations, property owners. It is something we, we try to do a good job at, but, but need, need to do more of. And, and um, you know, uh, so, some of the tools that we have right now, we, we, we work directly with the, the Federation of Vermont Lakes and Ponds, which is an umbrella group of lake associations from across the state and provide them with a lot of information. And, and their members 
they represent different lake associations. So that's a great and effective way we, we communicate with this umbrella group, the Federation of Vermont Lakes and Ponds, and they send those information back to all the different lake associations that are members. So that's one way. Um, we do, we try to do some, some formal training about um, you know, lake friendly practices, particularly on the shoreland. So we, every year we do a natural shoreland erosion control training. And we've had hundreds of contractors and other actors working in, in, in lake shorelands just participate in that training, get certified. And that's something we do on, on an annual basis, just so that folks are aware of what some of the state of the art practices are to allow for some development to take place around the lake, but, but do it in a, in a lake friendly way and, and one that complies with statute. We do have some members of our team that go out to schools uh, through a, an effort called Project Wet and do some lake related education, you know, kind of in the, the, the realm or the, the overall effort to do environmental education. Um, but that's, we, we don't have specific staff dedicated for that. So that's something that folks do in addition to their normal responsibilities. And, and again, I wish, I wish we could do more of that. But otherwise, yeah, our, our website is a, is a repository of information. We have, I think one of the most popular things is, is the depth charts uh, for lakes uh, because anglers use those and people who, who, who you know, do boating recreation use those depth charts. But if, if you're stopping by our website to download a depth chart, you can check out some of the other things we're doing, look at some of the data we have. We've just put up interactive tools that folks can look at some of our data for, for their lake and, and see what the trends are over time. And we also have these very high resolution land cover maps uh, around the lake and its watershed. So if, if you're curious about you know, what's happening in my, in my lake watershed, how much land is being used for agriculture, how much land is sort of residential or, or being used for um, property that they may have impervious surfaces versus other land uses, those, those maps are great as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, those are a good example. We, we, we do go out to some of these lake association meetings in the summer months when, when folks are at the lakes, when seasonal residents are at their camps and folks who may be outside of Vermont in the winter come back to Vermont for the summer and, and talk about what we're up to. Um, and, and again, we, we, we work for the state of Vermont. We work for all Vermonters. So if you have any questions, just get in touch with us through our website, and we'll be happy to, to respond and, and try to answer any questions you have. Great, well, thank you very much. Uh, this has really been <laughs> fascinating. And uh, I wanna thank Oliver Pearson, the Lake and Ponds Program Manager for the Vermont Department of Environmental and Federal Conservation for being with us on Positively Vermont. This is Dennis McMahon, and thank you for watching.